Welcome to the Shooting Show, brought to you in part by Gun Owners of America, Larry Pratt, Executive Director, and by Shooting Times Magazine, and also by Springfield Armory, Wesson Firearms, the United States Practical Shooting Association, Dillon Precision, Ducks Unlimited, the International Handgun Metallic Silhouette Association, Clark Custom Guns, Shotgun News, Fort Knox, Wyoming Arms, and a number of other good friends and supporters. Hello, I'm Johnny Rowland, and welcome to another edition of The Shooting Show. We want to thank everyone who's watching this week. You know, we heard from a cable company last week that told us they're running our show three times weekly, and that does nothing but please us. So we want to remind you, if you're watching on satellite, please call your local cable company or television station and tell them that our show is free to them and they can actually make money by selling time on the places we've left in the show for their local advertising. We're so glad to have you. I think we've got another great show for you. We're going to uh, look at a couple of cowboy guns today, so let's let another shooting show begin. Now, friends, the first gun we're going to look at today is, and I said earlier, we're going to look at a couple of cowboy guns, as some people like to say. This is a Ruger Super Blackhawk in 44 Magnum with uh, one difference from most of them that we'll see out there, and this one has a 10-inch barrel. In fact, it may be 10 and a half. Try to tell you the truth, I hadn't measured it, but uh, these are very fine guns. Uh, it is a single-action revolver. And you know, single action revolvers have an awful lot going for them that uh, some of us who handle other types of guns sometimes forget. And one of which is they're extremely strong. This is one of the most rugged handguns, in fact, that has ever been built by anyone. And Ruger started on the Super Black Hawk back, uh, I believe it was either in the late 50s or early 60s. They had a Black Hawk in a 44 Magnum and it was just a little bit light so they made the gun just a little bit larger, made the grip a little larger. And of course, this model here is very popular for hunting uh, or for silhouette. You will get uh, more velocities out of this long barrel, but for the simple reason, you have more burn time. Your bullet has more time in the barrel to gain speed from all the powder burning back here in the barrel and, and cylinder. So uh, again, this is uh, one of the very finest hunting handguns uh, and a lot of people use these in silhouette. Of course, our good friends with the Wesson Firearms Company, uh, they have a premier silhouette revolver, but uh, some people may prefer a single action gun or may not have quite as much money to spend. So in that case, the Ruger Super Blackhawk is an awfully good gun to start with. And of course, if you learn to shoot the gun well, uh, you can just shoot as long as you want to because I believe that the first perfect score with revolvers was shot with one of these uh, Super Blackhawks. But the gun is, is very simply made uh, to load the gun. You'll push out the loading gate and you put the cartridges in one at a time. And on the new model uh, Rugers, the uh, single actions like this, you have a, and of course we know this gun is unloaded. We check every last one of them. All of them we handle are always unloaded because I darn sure don't want to have an accident. I sure would hate for you folks to see me have an accident here, but I'd much, <laughs> I'd more hate for me to have one, period. So we're just going to be safe, safe, and safe. You have a transfer bar, which literally comes up in the frame. It's a piece of metal that uh, fits between the firing pin and this uh, place on the hammer. Now, that will only comes up when the hammer is all the way cocked to the rear. It raises that transfer bar so the hammer can strike the firing pin. Now then, when the trigger is forward and the hammer is at rest, the, the transfer bar is down out of the way. So these guns, the new model Super Blackhawks and Blackhawks 2 for that matter, can be carried with six rounds in the chamber safely because there's due to that transfer bar mechanism there's no way that the hammer can uh, uh, let the firing pin rest on the primer of a cartridge but uh, this particular gun we uh, uh, have borrowed from our good friends at Britain's in Shreveport and someone has fitted some uh, 
uh, mother of pearl. Uh, how about plastic grips on this gun? And I'm going to just forget about what George Patton said about a pearl handled uh, handgun because he was not too fond of pearl handled grips, I believe. But uh, these grips are actually very comfortable. You know, one of the advantages a single action has when it recoils up in your hand, you don't get the shock uh, that you'll get from, uh, say, a double action revolver of the same weight because it actually recoils up in your hand and it helps uh, uh, dissipate some of the backward force. It doesn't really hurt you. And we're going to compare the size of the Super Black Hawk here and our 629 Smith & Wesson Classic DX. Both of these are tremendous handguns, but they're just different. The uh, grip on this double action revolver is typically higher, and you get a more straight line of recoil back into your hand. And it's just, uh, it's just apples and oranges. They're just different guns. But as far as strength and durability and simplicity, uh, you just can't go wrong on one of the Super Blackhawks to take the gun down for cleaning, and that's another advantage these guns have. They're so simple to maintain. You'll take the loading gate out like this, and you have a spring-loaded pin here uh, on the cylinder pin, and you'll mash that and pull the cylinder pin up, and of course then you can take your cylinder out for cleaning. They're extremely convenient. You can get all to the inside of the action here uh, and just really do a nice job of cleanup. It also, uh, it's easy to clean the barrel with a cleaning rod because your cylinder uh, is out of the gun. It's just a really neat and strong system. Uh, I've heard of these guns shooting for years and years and years, and uh, very rarely have I ever heard of one of the Ruger single actions uh, giving any trouble or uh, breaking down due to some defect. So they're really first quality handguns for hunting, and a lot of people think, well, since this gun is uh, it's slow to load, it's slow to unload, uh, it might not be the first choice for home defense. Well, let me tell you what. If this is all you've got, or if you need a defensive gun at the time, it, uh, and you have one of these Super Blackhawks loaded with 44 Magnums, uh, you are not underarmed because these are tremendously easy to shoot guns. As I was saying, due to the nature of the cartridge itself, it's easy to cock the gun in recoil and be ready to shoot again. It'll go off, it's going to roll up in your hands, and then you can cock the gun, and by the time you have your sight picture reacquired, you're ready to shoot again. So for long distance shooting with one of these guns, and typically they will shoot into a group of, of uh, three to four inches at 100 yards if you put a scope on one so you can really see and get a good firm sandbag rest with ammunition that the gun likes, uh, they will shoot into three, four, five inches at 100 yards regularly. And uh, with this longer barrel, you do have a longer sight radius with open sights. This gun is easier to shoot because you can tell more about uh, your sight picture. You have a, shall we say, a finer bead. But uh, these guns can be used for home defense and the, the cartridge is so powerful, uh, you're not as likely one of these cartridges, if you hit what you're aiming at, say you have uh, uh, an animal in your yard that is dangerous or whatever else, or, or anything else that might be a threat to your home, you've got the power available with these guns to do just about whatever you need to do. Also, since it is a 44 Magnum, it will shoot the very mild-mannered 44 Specials. So again, that can be used for home defense. It's going to have very low recoil, and it's still a big old cartridge. It's a big bullet. Uh, it's not going to go through several houses and, and hurt someone uh, uh, outside the home if you did have to fire it. So we also uh, are going to run a velocity check today to give you an example of what the longer barrel will do in comparison to our 5-inch uh, 629 that we were looking at earlier. Now, friends, speaking of our 629 that we tested on our show recently, uh, this particular gun comes with a round butt configuration and uh, my problem is in shooting the heavier loads that this gun really shoots so well and accurately and will stand up to shooting the narrow uh, grip frame on these uh, classic guns uh, truthfully is pretty tough on your hand 
and uh, I had done quite a bit of shooting with it though, a week or so ago and my hand was sore for several days because of the back strap. Well, as you can as you can see, the grip looks a little different. So I have a quick fix for someone with one of these guns uh, that kicks really hard because any 44 Magnum is going to have some recoil. So real basically, let me show you what I did. I went down to the local discount store and bought a bicycle inner tube. Now this is a little trick that I picked up from Rob Gates, uh, who was with Glock, in fact, and he was using a bicycle inner tube on his Glock as an added uh, grip aid. And I said, wait a minute, this may work on one of these hard-kicking revolvers. So I had changed the grip on this Smith & Wesson. Well, here we have your basic bicycle inner tube, which I've already cut. So what you do you will take a piece about so long, let me show you how I did that, because this may be useful to a lot of you out there who have a problem with uh, these hard kicking guns kicking your hand. Take your knife and cut a strip out of the inner tube about so long. Now then, this strip will go on the grip like so, and I've already got this one in place. It will, and, and of course it'll be a good tight fit. And I did one more thing other than put this bicycle inner tube on there. I cut a couple of narrower strips like so. I cut a couple of these and I put underneath the back on the back of the grip frame here between the larger piece of inner tube and the uh, and the Pacmire grip that I put on this gun. So what this effectively does, and it'll go on there and it's tight enough where it'll stay. What this does, and of course you can see here, it cushions in the web of your hand uh, the gun in recoil. And trust me on this one, this is a a, uh, about a two dollar and twenty five cent addition that you can make and you got enough inner tube there to work over about a dozen guns but it makes the gun so much more pleasant to shoot with heavy loads and those of you out there who uh, shoot a heavy recoiling handgun a good bit this will be of great interest to you because uh, I don't think it's it's that ugly <laughs> these are real pretty guns that I'm more concerned with function than I am with looks and uh, it really helps in shooting the gun well because you know it's just not going to hit your hand as hard. I'm not particularly recoil sensitive but a gun like this with a shorter barrel uh, does have a tendency to have a pretty good kick in it and this has just tamed this gun down uh, remarkably well and plus it's comfortable uh, in my hand I, and I'm sure that a number, of, uh, a number of you out there will also find this useful, so I want to throw that in for today. Now then, back to our Super Black Hawk. Now friends, we're going to shoot our 5 inch 629, uh, which is uh, a faster uh, a 5 inch barrel. This is really a premium Smith & Wesson. So let's chronograph, watch the numbers on the base of the chronograph. We're going to shoot a uh, 240 grain jacketed hollow point a Remington full charge 44 Magnum through the chronograph out of the 5 inch Smith & Wesson. We're going to compare that to the longer barrel Ruger in just a moment. So watch the screen on the chronograph. Alright, it shows 1,283 feet per second. Now friends, let's take our 10 and a half or so inch Ruger Super Blackhawk. We've just shot the 5 inch 629 Smith and Wesson and let's see how much difference with this Remington 44 Magnum 240 grain jacketed hollow point that the extra five inches of barrel makes. Watch the screen on the chronograph now at the bottom. So 1514 feet per second so you're looking oh at about 230 or 40 feet per second greater it'll probably average about 250 feet per second more velocity out of the 10-inch barrel. And believe me, out of 100 yards, that extra 200 and so feet per second 
will make a difference on a game animal or on a steel ram. Friends, the shooting show will be back in one minute after this break for your local cable company or television station. only gone for a minute. I didn't realize it might be dangerous. I never thought something might happen. Whatever the excuse for an accident in the home, the result, unfortunately, is the same. Hi, I'm Grits Gresham, and believe me, if you just take a moment to make absolutely sure guns are unloaded and secured in a safe place, you'll never have to make an excuse for a gun accident in your home. This message is a public service of this station and the National Shooting Sports Foundation. It's fast, it's exciting, it's challenging, it's fun. This is the USPSA, United States Practical Shooting Association, the fastest growing sport in America today. If you'd like to become more proficient and confident with your firearm, meet new and interesting people and compete with thousands around the world, join the USPSA. There's a local chapter near you. All right, friends, we're going to shoot a 180 grain full charge uh, Remington 44 Magnum. Let's see what kind of velocities we get out of the 5 inch Smith & Wesson. Again, watch the screen on the chronograph. All right, that's running 1,520 feet per second out of a 5 inch barrel. And you see we've left our time from the Smith & Wesson 5-inch barrel uh, on the chronograph. So let's shoot the Super Black Hawk with the same 180 grain loading and see how much difference it makes with that extra 5 inches of barrel. My goodness, 1,864 feet per second. Well, friends, trust me on that one. That is smoking. <laughs> That bullet is flying. So you can really see, you can get a good idea there of the velocity increase uh, that that extra five inches of barrel gives you. Now friends, a moment ago, and of course we had a cloud come up since we were doing our chronographing, but uh, uh, you can see that the extra five inches of barrel for the 44 Magnum really do make a difference because they have a lot of powder to burn there. And of course the uh, five inch barrel 629 is much much easier to carry but if I were going deer hunting and I anticipated shots of 100 yards or so uh, I believe I'd take a hard look at the longer barrel gun or if I were silhouette shooting uh, and wanted to knock over a steel target at 220 yards uh, the 10 inch barrel will definitely give you some advantage well now then let's look at the gun in recoil to see just how a single action does recoil. So we're going to load it with a 240 grain uh, jacketed hollow point. Let's put a couple of them in there in fact. All right, we're going to thumb cock it like you have to do for every shot. And we're ready to shoot. Now watch the gun roll in my hand. It really wasn't painful. All right, let's watch it again. Watch the gun roll in my hand. Wasn't so bad at all because the grip design, like a plow handle, uh, really makes it easy to shoot. All right, friends, let's for, just for grin since we're here, and I hope to do a long-range accuracy test on this particular gun on another show, 
But let's just take a look at that 180 grain uh, jacketed hollow point moving at 1800 feet a second out of this gun. Let's see what it does to this water jug that we have placed over here. And now, friends, here's some important information from Gun Owners of America, 8001 Forbes Place, Suite 102, Springfield, Virginia. Their zip code is 22151. Or you can give them a call for further information on the organization at area 703-321-8585. This is Larry Pratt with a commentary from Gun Owners of America. Cecil Fraser is a New York City chef now on disability. He is also another example of why we need the Citizens' Self-Defense Amendment being promoted by Gun Owners of America. Fraser lives in Harlem, in a neighborhood surrounded by crime and violence that so typifies New York City. In order to get home from his job in a downtown restaurant, Fraser had to ride the subway late at night after the restaurant closed. Lamentably for Fraser, his ride started well after the unofficial 9 p.m. hour the crooks come out to terrorize subway riders. On one fateful evening, Fraser was studying some cookbooks on the train around midnight when he noticed two thugs robbing another passenger at knife point. Fraser called out to the other passengers, isn't anyone going to help? The silence was deafening. No one looked up. Probably no one else had a gun except Fraser, and his gun was being carried illegally because he had not gotten the unconstitutionally required approval of New York City's authorities to keep and bear arms. Without a gun, who would want to take on two knife-wielding thugs? Fraser decided to act as the thugs began to drag their victim to the train's door. The train was rapidly approaching a station, and Frazier feared for the victim's life if the thugs had the victim to themselves on the deserted station platform. Fraser approached the crime scene and told the thugs to release their victim. One of them decided to call Fraser's bluff, so Fraser fired past the crook into the empty station. The bravery of the robbers turned immediately to flight. Fraser stayed with the victim, so he was on hand when the police arrived. Predictably for New York City, the police arrested the Good Samaritan. Perhaps they felt that one like Fraser was better than returning to their headquarters empty-handed. It was three days before Fraser's distraught wife was able to find him and bail him out. Thanks to Fraser's attorney's help and the publicity of one of the New York papers, charges were not pressed against Fraser. But his gun was taken forever by the police, and Fraser still remembers that he spent three days in jail for saving the life of a helpless victim. So we need a self-defense amendment so that outrageous laws such as those in New York City cannot be used to help criminals terrorize the law-abiding. And now, friends, we're going to feature the great Rob Latham as part of the Shooter Ready tape, which is available from Dillon Precision Products Incorporated, 7442 East Butheris Drive in Scottsdale, Arizona. The zip code is 85260. Now, you can call them for information on the tapes they have available or for information on their tremendous reloading equipment. Their phone number is 1-800-421-7632. The action shooting sport has grown rapidly over the past 10 or 12 years. This growth was led by California and Arizona, where men like Jeff Cooper, Jack Weaver, Ray Chapman, Thel Reed Jr., Eldon Carl, and Terry Allison envisioned pistol competition that featured action scenarios. Targets instead of round bullseyes would be armed adversaries, often more than one. Time required to hit the target was as important as accuracy. They called this new type of competition practical or combat pistol shooting. The term combat has since been dropped for the more innocuous titles of action or IPSC shooting. IPSC stands for International Practical Shooting Confederation. Today, IPSC matches are held all over the world, involving shooters who believe in the sport and the safety and professionalism surrounding it. That was an El Presidente. 12 shots on three targets with the draw and a reload under five seconds. 
The techniques required are extremely simple, and we're going to teach them to you step by step. If that was a little quick, we're going to slow it down. First, one more at normal speed. Now, let's slow it down 50%. Slow down to half speed, it still seems confusing. Let's go to the basics. To become a good shot, you'll master many techniques, none more important than a steady hold. Let's begin there. First, let's cover the two-handed firing grip. The strong hand, that which pulls the trigger, should be as high on the gun as possible. The tang or grip safety of the gun should press firmly down on the web between your thumb and trigger finger. The gun should pretty much be in line with your arm. The grip should be firm as is comfortable. No death grips here, just about the same as a hearty handshake. The strong hand thumb should be resting on the safety. Fingers of support hand are below the trigger guard, allowing the support hand to be placed lower on the gun. This creates greater leverage to control muzzle flip. Support hand should pinch firmly on strong hand, with base of support hand touching the left side of the gun creating a comfortable, consistent, stable grip. Let's talk about the shooting stance. The head and torso should be erect. Avoid tilting the head forward or to the side. Facing the targets, your shoulders should be almost perpendicular. Your left foot, if right-handed, should be three to four inches farther forward than the right. Arms are straight with elbows nearly locked out. Do not raise your shoulders up any further than is natural. Avoid any sort of push-pull motion with either arm. Both arms should be pushing in towards each other. Once again, this should not be exaggerated, but should be a comfortable, relaxed pressure. With this stance, all side-to-side -side motion is accomplished through bending the knees and hips and rotation at the waist. Arms and shoulders remain stable. I'm now going to show you the motions it requires to do a quick, safe, accurate, consistent draw. For the sake of discussion, we're going to start with our hands up in the classic surrender position. With the hands up, we'll call this position one. The motion to the gun, we will call movement one. This is the least important movement of all. A fast guy to a slow guy makes hardly any difference in time here. If you go here or if you go here, that's measured in thousands of a second. Put very little conscious thought in trying to jump the gun or move your hand abnormally quick because that'll simply cause you problems when you get to position two, which is your hand resting on the butt of the gun. A critical part of the draw occurs at position two. It is very important that you learn how to do this smoothly and consistently. Your hand goes from one to two. You must get a firm, yet you don't have to have a locked-in grip. I'll show you now. One to two. Hand down to the gun. You're not trying to kill the gun by squeezing it to death. You hold it as hard as you would hold a hammer where you're driving nails. One to two. Snatch the gun out of the holster. Probably the most critical part of the draw uh, from a speed aspect. You can come to the gun quickly snatch the gun out of the holster and then it's quick. If you come down, hold the gun and pull it, it's slow. You snatch the gun out from two, going to position three, your left hand is to the side. You never get in front of the muzzle with your left hand. The left hand pushes in. It makes a grip. When you're about halfway extended, you then have your full shooting grip. Now that we're shooting two-handed, it makes you wonder, why did we ever shoot one-handed? It's obviously slower. Well, the Army trained their soldiers to shoot one-handed because they were holding the horse with the other hand, and we seldom bring the horses to the range with us anymore. To finish, let's go over it one more time. You need to move your hand in a smooth, consistent motion. We don't want your body bouncing around. You move smoothly. Pop the gun out. Left hand comes on. Safety comes off and you reach the shooting position. The gun fires as soon as the gun becomes motionless and the sights are aligned.
Now, friends, if you really want to learn from one of the master shooters on the scene today, you might think about getting this tape from Dylan Precision. This is the Shooter Ready tape, and it is, of course, much longer. We ran a short excerpt here, and you can really learn some things from the great shooter that Rob Latham is. Again, that's Dylan Precision Products Incorporated, 7442 East Butheris Drive, Scottsdale, Arizona. The zip code, again, is 85260. Their phone number, you can call them at 1 800 421 7632. The shooting show will be back in one minute after this break for your local cable comedy or television station. And now, friends, we're very pleased to present Lieutenant Colonel Art Alpin, retired, with one of his West Point lectures. And Art now heads up the A-Square Companies, which uh, they build some of the finest big game rivals in the world. You can get more information on the A-Square products by writing them at One Industrial Park in Bedford, Kentucky. Their zip code is 40006, or you can give them a call at area 502-255-7456. Field artillery in the war between the states was primarily an anti-personnel weapon. The most popular field artillery piece on both sides during the war was the 12-pound Napoleon. It was light enough to be maneuvered as a field artillery piece, yet fired full charge 12-pound ammunition. This ammunition consisted of four major types of projectiles. Solid or round shot was a solid iron ball. Like all other projectiles, it was attached to a wooden sabo by metal bands. The sabo improved the accuracy and served double duty by having a woolen powder bag attached to it. This meant that when loading, the powder charge, sabo, and projectile were all one piece and could be loaded with one stroke. Shell was a hollow iron ball filled with black powder and using a Borman or similar type of fuse. The fuse was a wooden plug containing a powder train in a groove. The cover was a scale graduated in seconds. The gunner estimated the range and consequent time of flight to the target and called out the number. The fuse cutter cut a hole in the fuse cover at the appropriate mark. Hopefully, the powder gases escaping past the projectile would ignite the fuse which would burn for the required number of seconds before causing the projectile to explode. This was a very iffy thing. Problems with fuses, range estimation, and variations in muzzle velocity made it near impossible to get the projectile to explode in the right place. Spherical case was the same as shell, except that the hollow area in the shell contained a very small burster charge and a number of separate iron balls. Grape or canister shot was used on infantry at less than 400 yards. This collection of small iron balls converted the Napoleon into a giant shotgun. When the infantry closed to within 180 yards, one powder charge could be loaded with two containers of canister, thereby doubling the number of projectiles to 24 pounds. Explosive shell and spherical case 
had little bursting power and were unreliable. The preferred rounds were solid shot and canister. We will demonstrate how to load using this six pounder which has been re-rifled on the James principle. After the shot, the number three closed off the touch hole or vent with a padded leather glove called a thumb stall. Number one dipped the sponge end of his rammer into a water bucket and swabbed the bore in order to extinguish any sparks remaining from the previous shot. Number two received the new projectile powder combination from the powder monkey and placed it at the muzzle. Number one reversed his rammer and rammed the cartridge home. Number three then removed the thumb stall from the vent and using a vent prick cut open the cartridge in the bore. Number four placed the friction primer in the vent and took the slack out of the lanyard. At any time during this process, the gunner aimed the weapon. For elevation changes, he used the hand screw mounted underneath the breech. While deflection changes were made by physically moving the trail left and right. Upon command, number four would give a final pull on the lanyard. The friction primer acted like a giant kitchen match and set off the propelling charge. As the gun rolled back six to 12 feet in recoil, the crew members seized the carriage and rolled it forward to approximately the same starting position. You may ask about rifled field artillery, but it was not that effective. Though it was more accurate, its recoil took it out of position after every shot. Each succeeding shot was the equivalent of opening fire again. The rounds could not be walked into the target. Rifles were inefficient at handling canister shot, and their explosive projectiles had a weak burster charge and an extremely unreliable contact fuse. Since the projectiles were oblong, they normally dug deeply into the ground before explosion and had little effect. It would take more than 30 years, plus the invention of high order explosive filler, smokeless powder, cartridge cases, breech loaders, good contact fuses, and hydro pneumatic recoil systems before field artillery had the characteristics which you and I understand today. We will watch a genuine 12-pound Napoleon being fired with solid shot and canister shot against formations of silhouette targets. We will be loading slowly and out of sequence and we'll be using a separate powder bag of aluminum foil in order to reduce the possibility of a premature discharge. To reduce chance of misfire, the number three man will put priming powder down the vent before the friction primer is inserted. Infantry 400!
I am sure you expected the canister shot to be impressive, but the round shot was surprising. They bounced through the formation like a bowling ball gone berserk. Every strike upon the ground and every impact with a target created secondary projectiles which traveled through the target area at odd angles. Wartime stories of round shot hurling rifled muskets, canteens, and pieces of bodies as secondary projectiles are true. One can only imagine what it must have looked like when a battery of six of these were online firing at maximum rate. During the war, maximum rate for these weapons was four rounds per minute. This is faster than we were firing since we put a premium on safety and intentionally went slowly. By calculating the rate of advance of infantry using Hardy's manual, and comparing this to the rate of fire, we find that an infantry unit attacking a Napoleon field piece from 1,500 yards out would, by the time they arrived at the gun, receive 676 pounds of round shot and canister from that single field piece alone. This brings up two important side points, Gatling guns, and leadership. The Gatling gun of the war between the states was the size of this field piece, yet its combat range was exactly the same as the rifled musket. Since cartridge cases were not yet practical, Gatling gun crews had to load and prime steel sleeves as if those sleeves were 58 caliber rifled muskets. These sleeves were then fed into the gun as ammunition. After every couple of hundred rounds, they had to cease fire to reload the sleeves and clean out the vast quantities of powder fouling which escaped past the gap between sleeve and barrel. No one in his right mind would pick a Gatling gun over any smoothbore field piece. With Napoleon's belching death, why did men go forward? They were led from the front. During the war between the states, over 160 general officers from both sides were killed. All but one or two were killed leading their men in battle from the front. This is far in excess of all general officer casualties of the United States in all other wars combined. Despite the death and destruction, soldiers of both sides went forward to their job. At the Battle of Newmarket, for example, the Corps of Cadets from the Virginia Military Institute went on line near the Bushong House and charged. They crossed this field from the Bushong House to where you are standing
approximately 600 yards and the location of a federal battery. They not only seized the battery, they actually broke the Union line asunder, putting it to flight. The price they paid for moving across that short space of ground, some of which was dead space, in which they were protected from fire, was 10 dead and 45 wounded out of 222 total engaged. I have some recovered targets. These shot with canister shot. And these hit with round shot. When you study the war, remember these targets and the range film. They will give you a new dimension on the peculiar problems of that war and the courage of the troops involved. Was the 12-pound Napoleon effective? Yes. Its canister at close range and round shot at long range was deadly. You can imagine what would happen to soldiers hit with the round shot as these targets were hit. Our thanks again to Art Alpin from A-Square, our good friend. For more information on A-Square products, write to them at 1 Industrial Park, Bedford, Kentucky, 40006, or give them a call at area 502-255-7456. Stay tuned for more of the shooting show after this break for your local cable company or television station. remind you of our good friends at Shooting Times Magazine, the absolute best general information shooting magazine available on your newsstand today. They have all sorts of articles on handguns and long guns and hunting and all sorts of information about reloading and gun safety and many, many other fine features by some of your favorite firearms writers. For subscription information, call Shooting Times at 1-800-727-4353. Shooting times, the best there is. Now, friends, another gun that's many times associated with the Old West, uh, this is the Winchester Model 94 in 3030 uh, chambering. Now, this is about as good a deer gun for 100 to 150 yards as money can buy. Uh, typically, these guns are the Winchester 94s, many times are used without a scope because if you can hit a target roughly the size of a one gallon water jug, well that's pretty much uh, going to be comparable to the vital area of a deer or a similar size game animal. If you can hit that with open sights at a hundred yards, well you can kill deer with these things. But they're very reliable guns. The uh, design was uh, perfected about, I believe it was 1894 since this is a Model 94. But these are very fine guns for their light and handy. Their a reasonable size. Uh, the lever action is, is pretty smooth. You just have to work with them and become accustomed to them. Of course, what happens when you work the lever? It immediately cocks the hammer and a shell is released from the magazine on the bottom of the gun and you have a shell carrier here on the inside that brings the shell or the cartridge up in conjunction for loading. And of course, when you bring the lever back up, it loads itself. And these guns can be fired very rapidly. The 30-30 is uh, a medium power cartridge. Uh, I would call it that, a medium power cartridge. We chronographed the, the uh, Remington 150 grain bullet just a little bit earlier at about 2,300 feet per second with a 150 grain bullet. Uh, it's a good game cartridge, uh, 100, 150 yards, uh, certainly within your limits of your trajectory. So uh, the 30-30, 
is not outdated uh, as compared there are a lot of semi-automatic carbines out there but these are still neat and handy guns with expanding bullets the 3030 is still an effective cartridge so I want to remind you that in these tubular magazines we only load if you're a hand loader round nose bullets because uh, the primer uh, the nose of this bullet is going to be up against the primer of the one in front of it so if you have a sharp bullet there is a, a potential in setting off under recoil uh, the other cartridges in the magazine so we only load round nose bullets but the way these guns work you load the, the cartridges one at a time in the loading gate here on the side and we're going to do that for several cartridges and it's really pretty simple in the way they work and of course it's a little trick to it there there we go here we go it's not that hard you just have to be sure they're pressed all the way in because the cartridges have to catch. So we're going to load several here. And, well, I said I am. <laughs> That's part of it, uh, is getting to know these guns, is just using it and doing it, shooting the gun, to become proficient with it. But uh, let's see what this gun looks like in recoil. Uh, and again, they can be shot accurately. Or right, we've just levered a shell in the chamber. So let's watch it recall for just a moment. Like I said, of course, we'll, we'll leave her out the last empty. They can be fired rapidly, and they're really neat guns to have, excellent deer guns. And uh, I'll always mention uh, on a gun like this, if this is all you have for home defense, well, you're still pretty well armed because these guns are accurate. They'll shoot within normally three, four inches at 100 yards, uh, normally into two inches or so at 50. And it is a powerful cartridge, so they can be pressed into use for all kinds of things. Your recoil is really not that substantial with these guns, as I, as I have said earlier. Your power level is still substantial. So we'll be doing an accuracy test on the 3030. We have several accuracy tests we have lined up to do on our program. So we'll be doing more of that on future programs. But right now, let's just have some fun shooting the 3030 at some water jugs. Why not? Now, friends, we sure want to mention Shotgun News, the trading post for anything that shoots. You have over 35,000 firearms bargains, 36 big issues for only $20. Shotgun News, post office box 669, Hastings, Nebraska. Their zip code is 68902. You can call them at area 402-463-4589 or for MasterCard and Visa customers for subscriptions only, call 1-800-345-6923. Shotgun News, get it today, don't put it off. Now friends, part of our function here with the shooting show is to bring you some information on new products. So we're going to go back to the SHOT Show footage we taped earlier this year at the SHOT Show in New Orleans, and here's a fairly new gun company called Grendel, and they have some things they want to show you. Here we are at the Grendel booth, a very new company. This is Renee, and this is Nancy, and they have some most interesting looking handguns they're going to show us. So, Renee, Renee, tell me what uh, that is, that gun is you're holding now. This is the new Grendel P12. It's the updated version of the P10. It now has a detachable magazine where before it loaded from the top. Mm -hmm. It was an internal magazine, but not a detachable one. It also holds one more round now. Mm -hmm. This is a threaded barrel with muzzle brake. Mm -hmm. You can have it with or without. Right. It holds 12 rounds, 380. Uh -huh. And as I understand, you folks are economically priced. Is that correct? This, is, this one, uh, the other price is one twenty one ninety five. Well, you know what? A lot of our viewers are concerned now with the economy and the state it's in. You're doing good by having something people, not something neat, but something that something's neat and people can buy and afford to shoot. So that's most interesting. What else? Uh, what's this larger gun over here to our right, your left, I suppose? This is the 22 Magnum. It's a 30 round clip. This is the 8 inch barrel with muzzle brake. Uh huh. So it's a 30 shot 22 Magnum. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tremendous idea. 
Uh, and I was just talking with Nancy a moment ago, and she says that they're very accurate and they are reliable. So you know what? I can hardly wait to get one of those for testing for our program. It's also got an ambidextrous safety on it. Ambidextrous safety. Shooting left, left, or right hand. Well, it is an interesting looking firearm. It looks to be very well made. And I'll tell you what we'll do. As soon as you can send us one, we'll darn sure test it on our show for you. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking time to visit with us thank you. today at the SHOT Show. Get ready to order the most exciting videotape ever offered on television. It's the best of guns, guns, guns. 60 minutes of action, excitement, and the most amazing display of firearms available on video. Pistols, rifles, shotguns, and machine guns. See Bob Munden, the fastest gun who ever lived. USPSA pistol competition. The Steel Challenge. U.S. Marine Corps weapons. Machine guns from around the world and lots of surprises. If you like guns, you'll love the best of guns, guns, guns. Available only through this special TV offer. Fast draw competition. Hand cannon. Soldier of Fortune firepower. How to shoot fast and lots more like you've never seen it before in this 60-minute action-packed video. Use your credit card to order toll-free now. Call 1-800-942-8273. You'll receive the best of Guns, Guns, Guns for just $29.95 plus $4 shipping. By ordering now, you'll receive this 28-page gun video catalog absolutely free. So call with your credit card right now, 1-800-942-8273 or send check or money order to 7888 Ostro Street, Suite A, San Diego, California, 92111. Friends, we hope you've enjoyed this edition of The Shooting Show. I'm Johnny Rowland, your host, and we hope that we can come back to your house again next week. If you would like to be on our show with some sort of club or music presentation, give us a call at area 318-222-8515. Remember, copies of our shows are available for $10.95 plus postage per weekly program. And we want to remind you to call your local cable companies because we are free to them and we want to be in as many areas as possible. See you next week.